Most poker players think they have a very good idea of when to continuation bet and how much. But I can tell you, they do not. Most people either continuation bet far too often or not nearly often enough. So in this video, we are going to be discussing the fundamentals of continuation betting so you know how to play this very common spot very well. First things first, should you just continuation bet every time? That's what we did back in the day. I actually wrote to do exactly that about 15 years ago in my first book because people folded far too often. So you should always ask yourself, will my particular opponent fold far too often? And if they will, you actually should continuation bet a lot, probably every time. Will your opponent rarely raise you? Meaning if you do have some nonsense bluff like one over card, you'll actually realize your equity sometimes. If that's the case, you should also continuation bet a lot. A very powerful strategy in most games is to bet frequently using a small size because if your opponent folds too off, too off, too often, you will immediately profit. Let's go through some basic poker math. The equation to figure out how often a bluff with 0% equity needs to work is the bet you're making divided by the bet you're making plus the pot. Now this presumes you have 0% equity. When you're bluffing, you usually won't have 0% equity in No Limit Texas Hold'em because one of your cards is live some portion of the time or you have a gut shot straight draw or an over card or something like that, right? So in this spot, let's say you bet 10% pot. What would the equation be? Well, it would be 0.1 divided by 1.1, right? 0.1 divided by 0.1 plus the pot, which equals 9%. That means your bluff with no equity needs to only work 9% of the time if you bet 10% pot, which means your opponent has to defend by calling or raising 91% of the time. It is difficult to defend 91% of the time, especially from out of position. Because if you consider how often you connect with a flop, with a pair or some sort of decent draw, it's only gonna be about 40% of the time. So they have to find another 50% of hands, almost everything to stick around with. And most people cannot do that. They fold far too often. Also, you're gonna find that your opponent should raise a lot versus a small bet. But most players do not. They call far too often. And for this reason, small frequent bets actually are a very good exploitative strategy especially when the board is not great for your opponent's range. Now I realize a 10% bet may be egregiously small, maybe even smaller than is allowed based on the rules of no limit hold'em. Consider a 20% or 25% pot bet though. Notice you bet 25% pot, you now have 0.25 divided by 0.25 plus one, which is 20%, which means your opponent needs to defend with 80% of their range. That's also very difficult to do. And this is why you see a lot of the absolute best poker players in the world continuation betting frequently and small, usually one big blind, in a whole lot of spots, especially in tournaments where stacks are starting to get a little bit shallower. Now, I do want to make it perfectly clear. Your opponent's MDF, minimum defense frequency, will very often not have to be stringently adhered to because they're going to usually underrealize their equity when they are out of position. But this gives you a rough guideline and just shows how powerful it is to continuation bet frequently using a tiny size. Notice whenever you start potting it, well, now your opponent only has to defend half the time. Way easier to defend half the time than it is to defend 91% of the time, right? 91% gets really uncomfortable. That's like one over card with some junk backdoor draw. That said, this is all exploitative stuff we're talking about here. What I want you always to consider as a poker player is how do I play a good, strong, fundamentally sound strategy and then adjust to take advantage of what your opponents do wrong. I realize a lot of the players in your games are just going to fold too much, so bet frequently and small and you'll probably be fine. But I want to discuss how you can develop an implementable strategy that will allow you to continuation bet at roughly the game theory optimal frequency so that you can crush pretty much everyone. So let's discuss game theory optimal continuation betting. There are two main things you have to figure out when you are betting. First, the frequency. How often do you want to bet? And second, the size. How big should you bet? Frequency is determined by the types of hands in your range, who has the range advantage, and who has position. While the size is determined by who has the nut advantage, who has range connectivity, 
or who has better range connectivity on the board, and if the board is very draw heavy or static, meaning current nut hands are likely to be the nuts by the river, and the stack depth. Realize that all of these things kind of get mushed together. Sometimes uh, this strategy I'm about to outline gets a little bit rough, but this is a very good strategy that will make it relatively easy for you to come up with a pretty good play in most scenarios. So first let's discuss frequency and then we'll discuss size. So when should you bet? First things first, we have to talk about the hand types. The hand types are a rough method to uh, roughly categorize is really rough apparently hands into various levels of strength to inform betting. You always want to take a look at your entire range and consider, do I have a premium made hand, a draw, a marginal made hand, or junk? You should always consider how every single hand in your range lines up. Uh, premium made hands are hands that are usually just good enough to bet and get all the money in. Draws are going to vary in strength from very high equity draws all the way down to junky draws. And the hands that are classified as a draw depend on your range, comp range composition and the board. For example, on Ace-9-3, there's not a whole lot of actual draws, right? So on Ace-9-3, maybe a hand like Jack-10 with a backdoor flush draw counts as a draw, even though it's not a particularly good one, right? Then you're going to have your marginal made hands. These are hands that want a little bit of money to go in the pot, but not a lot. Usually you'll end up betting these hands once, either on the flop or the turn, and then look to see a somewhat cheap showdown from there. These are going to be weak top pairs all the way down to something like ace high, maybe king high if there's an ace on the board. And then you have junk. This is just hands with little to no potential, hands that cannot really improve, hands that you're just giving up with at least on the flop. Now, if it, the flop goes check, check, and then your opponent checks again on the turn, sometimes this junk is going to turn into a bad draw or maybe you just decide to bluff it because you don't have any other logical bluffs. So I want to make it clear, you're not just totally giving up with your junk, but quite often, if you're not betting with your entire range on the flop, the junk often does not get bet. Next, range advantage. Remember, frequency is determined by hand types, range advantage, and position. The range advantage is this idea that one player's likely range has more equity on a particular flop than the other player's range. And you're going to find that on all flops, the preflop raiser almost always has an absolute range advantage over the preflop caller and your decision to bet frequently or infrequently is going to be based on how big that advantage is if the range advantage is small you're usually going to be betting less often if the range advantage is big you're usually going to be betting more often let me give you an example of this there's a program called equalab you can get that can calculate range versus range so you can see who has the advantage um, in various scenarios so here what we have is I have given, this is roughly a low jack or high jack raising range. Lo looks like a low jack raising range. Doesn't really matter. An early position raising range versus a big blind caller's range. Notice the big blind is missing. Aces, kings, queens, jacks, etc. This is probably 40 big blinds deep in a tournament if I had to guess. Let's put out a flop. Ace, seven, six. On ace, seven, six, using some logic, given the big blind did not re-raise before the flop, we know that they don't have aces, ace, king, ace, queen, hands like that, right? So they're going to be missing a lot of the absolute best hands. Plus, they're going to be calling preflop with a whole lot of junk. Like, notice 10-3 suited here is just absolute trash, right? So, the initial preflop raiser's range against the big blind caller's range has 65% equity. That is gigantic. It's really, really big. This is actually one of the flops where the initial raiser has the biggest advantage. And this is a spot where the initial raisers are going to be betting basically every time because they have a big range advantage. 65% is huge. Alternatively... What if the flop comes seven, six, five? Well, now the preflop caller's range, even if they have junk, you know, notice the junk down here, like 10, three suited has a flush draw sometimes, backdoor flush draw, a gut shot straight draw, right? So a lot of the junk is going to connect with this board and a lot of the initial raisers misses like queen jack are not particularly great on seven, six, five. So now notice, even though the initial raiser does still have a tiny bit of an advantage, 52.87%, Anything above 50% is considered an advantage. It's not much of an advantage at all. So this is a board that's going to get checked a whole lot more than ace, seven, six by the initial raiser because they lack the advantage. When you have an advantage in poker, you typically want to put money in, a, in the pot. So here are some rough categories. With more than 58% equity, you have a strong advantage. And when you have a strong advantage, you're going to be betting most of the time or every time. 
And that means you're going to be betting your premium hands, your draws, your marginal made hands, and your junk. You're just betting it all. With between 54% and 58%, that's a moderate advantage. You're going to be betting pretty frequently. And usually that's going to be with your premium hands, your draws, and then some extra bluffs, usually low equity bluffs like backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw, stuff like that. And then when you have a small advantage or no advantage, which is something like 54% or less, you're going to be betting less often with your weak advantage. And that's usually going to be just with premium hands and draws. And as the ranges get closer and closer to 50-50, or if somehow you're an underdog, you're going to be checking a ton. And actually this happens when someone raises and the big blind calls. In most scenarios, unless you're very short stack, the big blind should check almost every flop because they're basically always disadvantaged, right? I mean, I just showed you one of the best flops for the big blind and they only have 47%. And because of that, they have to check every single time because, well, they have nowhere near, you know, like 54% equity, okay? So as you have more of an advantage, you bet more often. Position also is going to heavily impact your strategy. In general, you're gonna be betting more often from in position than from out of position in pretty much all situations. And the main reason for this is because position is going to inform range advantage a lot, meaning the if you raise and someone calls in position against you, yes, they're going to be missing aces, kings, queens, and ace, king, but they're going to have a lot of good, strong, suited, and high card hands that are going to connect pretty well with the board. So they're not going to have quite as much junk in their range, but they're also not going to have quite as many very strong preflop hands in their range, but your ranges are kind of going to be on top of each other, right? So when the ranges are on top of each other, imagine both players have the same range, it's 50-50. So when you are out of position, that's going to make you bet less often, right? So when you're in position, you bet far more often compared to when you're out of position. And we're going to go through some examples of this soon from a GTO point of view. Next, how much do we bet? All right. Size is determined by nut advantage, range connectivity, and stack depth. However, there's also a general relationship between frequency and size. Typically, not always, but typically, as you bet more frequently, you typically bet smaller because you're just nudging money in the pot with a small range advantage. As you bet less frequently, because you don't have much of a range advantage, meaning you're only betting with premium hands and draws, right? When you're only betting premium hands and draws, you're betting with a very polarized range where your good hands are just happy to get it in and your bluffs are sometimes happy to get it in and sometimes not. In that scenario, usually you're going to be betting bigger, okay? Let's discuss the idea of nut advantage. A player has a nut advantage when they have more combinations of premium hands, which is usually two pair or better than their opponent on any particular board. And as you have the nut advantage, you bet much larger. And as you do not have the nut advantage, you bet much smaller. So let's consider two spots. Let's say under the gun raises and the big blind calls. Here's the under the gun range. Here's the big blind range. Flop comes ace, king, jack. Who has more premium hands on ace, king, jack? Well, take a look at the ranges. The under the gun player has like all of the nuts pretty much. The big blind has almost none of the nuts. So right off the bat, you know the under the gun player is going to have a big nut advantage. And this is a spot where the big blind, or the under the gun player is going to be betting very, very frequently. Maybe I said that wrong. I'm not sure. Under the guns betting very, very frequently using a big size in this scenario because they have a huge nut advantage. Consider Jack 5-5 five five, though. On Jack 5-5, five five, under the gun has lots of over pairs and pairs in general, and some jacks, but notice no fives, only ace five suited. Whereas the big blind has lots of suited fives and a little bit of offsuit fives, right? If they're a little bit looser, maybe they have even more fives. So this is a spot where even though the under the gun player is gonna have a huge range advantage because pairs are good on this board, because I mean, look at all the, all the hands that miss completely for the big blind, right? The big blind has the nut advantage. So in this situation, well, both these situations, the initial raiser is gonna have a big range advantage but a big, range, a big nut advantage on ace-king-jack, but a small nut advantage, or no nut advantage, on jack-five-five, five, which is going to result in tiny bets on that board. Okay, so as you have a bigger nut advantage, you typically bet bigger. No nut advantage, you bet tiny. Next, range connectivity. This is a rather loose idea, but I found this to be a pattern in general. As the board connects more strongly with your opponent's likely continuing range, you typically bet using a bigger size. And what this usually amounts to is that as the board is just more connected, 
As the board is more connected, such that it should connect with the opponent's range, you're going to bet bigger. And as the board is more uncoordinated, in general, you're going to be betting smaller. Usually. Why does I think usually is not okay? Usually is okay. Um, range connectivity, by the way, usually only matters when you have the range advantage. If you don't have the range advantage, you're not betting very often. And if you're not betting very often, you usually just bet big because you're betting polarized like we already discussed. Also, you will usually bet, goodness gracious, this slide's a mess. You'll usually bet small on boards where the current nuts is likely to be the nuts by the river. There's the idea of a dynamic board versus a static board. As the board is likely to change, you typically bet bigger. As the board is less likely to change in ways that logically connects with the ranges, uh, you typically bet smaller. So say the board is Jack-10-3 with a flush draw. Jack-10-3 with a flush draw is highly likely to change such that even top set on the flop is kind of unlikely to be the actual nuts by the river because the flush can come, a straight can come, whatever. Whereas on Jack-6-2, in that spot, there are not a whole lot of logical draws available, assuming, assuming the opponent doesn't have a whole lot of gut shots. So on Jack-6-2, you're going to be betting very small. So both are Jack-high boards, but they're very, very different. Next, stack depth is also going to impact the size. Typically, as stacks get deeper, you bet bigger because you want to have the ability to reasonably able to get in lots of chips by the river when you have a good hand if you feel inclined. As stacks are shallower, you typically can use much smaller sizes, which is why you see in tournaments people betting one big blind a whole lot of the time. Um, also, uh, when you are shallower stacked, you don't really need to protect your stack. And you don't need to be betting large such that you can't get all in by the river because the pot's already big enough to where you can just bet like one big blind on the flop, five on the turn, and then jam river or something like that. Um, the main exception to this is when you get really short and you can go all in. So here is a flow chart I made up. We'll briefly walk through this. This is something I definitely recommend you use on a regular basis. Frequency. If you're in position with a strong range advantage, Typically on boards like these, these are boards that connect very well with the initial razor, or at least you have a big range advantage, you're going to be betting frequently, 60% of the time or more. With a moderate advantage, such as on boards like these, you're going to be betting, you know, sometimes between 40 and 80%. I know that's kind of a big spread. And then with a weak advantage, like 975, you're going to be betting very infrequently. From out of position, Turns out you very rarely have a strong advantage because, like I said, the ranges line up on top of each other. With a moderate advantage, you're going to be betting sometimes, right? And then with a weak advantage, you're going to be betting actually very infrequently, like almost never sometimes, which is kind of neat. In terms of sizing, do you have the range advantage? If the answer is no, you typically want to be betting large. Uh, there are some exceptions to this as you get super deep stacked. Um, we're mainly talking about 40-ish to 80-ish big blinds deep in a tournament today. If you're 200 big blinds deep, you actually be, want to be betting smaller when in all scenarios where you lack the nut advantage for the most part. Anyway, talking about 40 big blinds today. We got to talk about specific spots because poker is a huge game. Okay, range advantage, no, bet large. Range advantage, yes. Do you have the nut advantage? No. If you do not have the nut advantage, you're often going smallish. Do you have the nut advantage? Yes. If so, how does the opponent's range connect with the board? Does it connect poorly? If they connect poorly, bet small. If they connect well, bet big. Okay, let's go through some examples. First, we're going to discuss specifically 40 big blinds deep with the range advantage. We're going to discuss how to play without the range advantage next. Let's take a look at ace, jack, five with a flush draw. So here we have 40 big blinds deep under the gun plus one raises versus the big blind. So under the gun plus one has this range. Big blind, I'll show you. Actually, we're not going to see their range, but their range is standard big blind range, right? They're missing a lot of the best hands. Three betting some suited connected stuff, some suited aces, et cetera, or some suited kings, some off uh, Broadway cards, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, ace, jack, five. This is a board where the current nuts is actually kind of likely to change, right? Because there's a flush draw, there are a bunch of gut shots. So with a huge equity advantage, 69%, that's gigantic, we're going to be betting very frequently, as we see, 95% of the time, might as well be 100. And we're going to be using mixed sizes between two-thirds pot and one-third pot, uh, when we ran this solver, I was trying to keep it very simple, two-thirds pot and one-thirds pot. There are plenty of times where you want to be betting big, like pot or over pot. There are plenty of times where you want to be betting tiny, like one big blind. I'm trying to keep this simple for now. If you want to study these, uh, study these spots thoroughly, check out 
pokercoaching.com. We have an advanced tournament course there and an advanced cash game class that's either out now or coming out very soon. We're going to be going really in depth on all sorts of various bet sizes. So as you see, mixed strategies betting across the board because our equity is through the roof. What about now when we raise from the button versus the big blind? Now our range is much wider. And notice, even though we still have all the good nut hands, we have a lot of trash now. Remember, on this, with this range, the strong under the gun plus one range, we have mostly good strong big cards that line up really nicely with this. Now we have a lot of junk. And as we have more junk in our range, we have to bet smaller. Also, our range advantage is not quite as big, which is going to result in perhaps less frequent betting, but 60% is still very big. We go back to our chart up here. Uh, it's not actually listed there. Here it is. Um, and 58% or more is a strong advantage that we're going to be betting most of the time, right? So as we see here, we have 61% bet most of the time. <coughs> what about out of position? Okay. Now, under the gun plus one raises and the button calls. Remember how I said from out of position, you're rarely going to have a huge advantage because the ranges are going to be on top of each other. This is one of the rare exceptions where you actually do still have a decently big advantage. But even then, you can't bet every time because your opponents can have a whole lot of ace in their range as well. The button calling range should be quite decent. And for that reason, we don't get to bet every time. We are betting very often. I want to make it clear. 28% from out of position is not a lot of checking. Usually you're checking a whole lot more than this. But as you see, we're betting the majority of the time with all sorts of stuff. It's interesting to see hands like eight, seven, sixes, fours, and two, threes betting a ton. You may be surprised that these essentially count as draws slash bluffs in this spot because if you do bet one of these hands and you spike the two outer, you stand to win a whole lot of chips and you don't actually have a ton of logical bluffs. I mean, we already are betting most of our king queens and uh, king tens and queen tens, right? So like find other logical draws. There really are not a whole lot of them. So we're really getting after it here. And I wanted to show this example because we do have a big range advantage. You're going to find that we check a whole lot more from out of position as the flop gets a little bit worse. All right, queen, 10, 5, all spades. Interesting spot. You're going to find that on this board, where the current nuts is likely to be the nuts by the river, a flush, right? If a flush is likely to be the nuts by the river, this is a spot where we're going to be betting small. Remember, as the board is more dynamic, more draw heavy, such that the current nuts is kind of unlikely to be the nuts by the river, you usually bet bigger, like in the previous spot. Here, we're going to be betting smaller. So notice here, we are betting small across the board. And this is a spot where I'm sure if we ran this with a one big blind bet size, we're going to be betting a lot of one big blind bets in the spot. Um, under the gun plus one versus the big blind. Notice we have a lot of flushes. We have a lot of ace high flush draws, right? This is a great spot for the initial raiser. And the big blind callers have a lot of offsuit junk and a lot of offsuit, or, well, uh, un, a suited junk that also does not make the flush. So we're going to be betting almost every time and tiny. From the button. Still, mostly a tiny bet being used. We have to bet less often, though. Notice our equity is far lower because now both players have a whole lot of trash, right? And as both players have more and more trash, we have to continuation bet less often in general. So we see our range advantage has gone down to 56%, and now we're betting less often, right? Uh, when we are betting here, we're going to be betting lots of flushes, lots of flush draws, lots of pairs. We're betting decently often. I realize that these ranges using mixed strategies are kind of difficult to look at, I'll show you how I go through and make implementable ranges in a little bit, but I just want to show these common scenarios first so you have some idea of how to approach them. What about out of position? Now we're going to be doing a lot of checking because our ranges are going to be all on top of each other now. Both players have lots of flushes, and when both players have lots of flushes, you have to proceed with caution. So as we see now, 56% equity, very little betting. So remember the earlier out of position spot, we had 60% uh, equity, and we were checking 28%. Now we have 56% and we're checking 60%, right? So we kind of lack the nut advantage. And, well, we don't really lack the nut advantage, but we don't have a huge nut advantage. And also the ranges are much closer, which is going to mean smaller bets and um, betting less often. What about Jack 6-2? Very uncoordinated board. Notice now we're checking basically none under the gun plus one versus the big blind. We are using some big bets. You're going to find it in spots where you use just a few big bets. You're usually doing it with your best made hands. They're very vulnerable to being outdrawn. That's usually going to be hands like over pairs, top pair, top kicker, and then some junky draws. And what are junky draws on Jack 6-2 that we have in our range? Notice we don't have 5-4 that would love to bet big. 
But we do have stuff like King Queen for two over cards. Queen 10, Queen 9, backdoor draws. So I think that makes a lot of sense. We're also going big with stuff like Ace 4 of Diamonds for backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw, and over card, which I think, again, makes, makes very, very good sense. And then we're betting small with everything else with a much more condensed range. Big bets are usually going to be your linear range of good hands that are vulnerable plus draws. Smaller bets are thinner value bets. Some super nut hands I don't mind if your opponent calls and things like that. All right. Uh, button versus big blind. You're going to find button versus big blind, by the way. You're usually betting small in general because you usually don't have much of a nut advantage compared to when you're raising from early position with a much stronger range to begin with. As we see, though, still a decent equity advantage. Not huge. We're having to check 22% of the time. So we see that our, range, our equity is going down and our checking percentage is going up a little bit, right? That said, this is an example of a spot where I think it's perfectly fine just to bet small every time because uh, going back to the very first slide in this presentation, I think this is a spot where most people drastically overfold because in this spot you have to check raise and continue with a whole lot of stuff facing a small bet now here's where we're talking about over our big big bets mostly jack six two from out of position our equity is again starting to shrink and now we're gonna be betting relatively polarized because we have a lot of good hands here that are almost always good but vulnerable as well as a lot of uh, hands that don't mind picking it up but at the same time, we need to apply pressure to a lot of the opponent's medium strength hands, like pocket sevens and pocket fives and queen ten of spades, right? And if you bet small here, that's going to allow the opponent to reasonably call with a lot of their range. But as you start betting big, you get protection with your hands that don't mind it, right? And you get a lot of bluffs through, so pretty cool spot. Jack six six. This will be the last one before we talk about how to play without the range advantage. Um, under the gun plus one versus big blind. Notice they check. We have a big range advantage, but unfortunately, almost no sixes in our range at all. And that's a problem. Notice also, we don't even have any hands like eight, seven suited. They don't mind betting. So we actually don't get to do a ton of betting in this spot. And if we do bet, we're going to be betting small. If we allowed for a smaller bet size here, we would, have, we would be betting more often. Typically, if you allow the solver multiple bet sizes, and one of the bet sizes is really small, and that's the one it likes. It, it can usually bet very small and frequently. In this spot, on Jack 6-6, six, six, I don't think most people check raise often enough. If not going to check raise often enough, again, bet very frequently. But it's a disaster to bet here 40 big blinds deep with an overpair and get raised, or like pocket sevens, right? Because if you bet pocket sevens and get raised, well, now you're in this nasty guessing game, and you don't want to be in a nasty guessing game. So just check it back and play a small pot. 40 big blinds, button versus big blind. Similar scenario, but now we do have some sixes, so we are getting to bet a decent amount of the time. The problem is we have a whole lot of trash, and so does the opponent, and our equity is starting to get a little bit lower. So we are betting sometimes, 32%, but certainly not 100% like a lot of people do. Jack 6-6, six, six, under the gun plus one versus button. Now, neither player has a whole lot of sixes, because remember, the button's not going to call with 8-6 suited too often. I mean, maybe they do, but... Not too often. They're, not, they're definitely not calling the 8-6 offsuit. You got to realize the big blind is going to be in the pot with 8-6 offsuit, right? So that's why you have to be very careful against the big blind because they have lots of sixes. So in this scenario, hands like a jack just still kind of count as the nuts. So we're just betting these and plowing money into the pots. Again, solvers using a lot of mixed strategies. I think it's probably reasonable just to find one bet size and use it in these spots. I don't think you want to get too bogged down in all the various bet sizes. So many people overly complicate things. If you pick the play that is most use most of the time and you mix it up a little bit from out of position you're probably going to be fine against most players that you are playing against before we move forward i want to tell you about my new book i have a new book it's called 100 essential tips to master no limit hold'em if you're enjoying this video well this book goes through a whole lot of spots very similar to it we discuss bankroll management value bet wide against calling stations on the river bet tiny from out of position when the turn checks through all sorts of stuff Lead on ace high four flush turns. Who'd have thought? It's all sorts of fun spots. We discussed developing strong heuristics. That's exactly what we're doing here. We talk about that and a whole lot more. 100 essential tips to master no limit hold them. We'll put links in the description below. You can go get it on Amazon or dmbpoker.com right now. Check it out. I am very, very sure you will learn a ton. Now, how do you play when you do not have the range advantage? Well, now... As a preflop raiser, without the range advantage, you can only bet with premium hands and draws, which is annoying. 
as a preflop raiser with no range advantage, you're usually gonna be betting using a polarized size because you're only betting your best hands that wanna get in plus some draws. When you're deep stacked, you're gonna want to consider sizing it up a little bit. Shallower stack, you're gonna want to consider sizing it down a little bit. As we see, again, we're in this region now, right? Where we really do not have much of an advantage. Without much of an advantage, you're just betting your best hands and your draws, and um, that's it. Nice and easy. So let's take a look at some examples. If you consider the flops that are gonna be bad for the initial raiser against the big blind, it's gonna be the middle, low, connected type board. So let's look at nine, seven, five. I can already tell you, we're not gonna have much of a range advantage and we're gonna be checking a lot. So notice, nine, seven, five, 40 big blinds deep. We are betting 55% of the time and it's just with a good, strong polarized range. Take a look at what's betting mostly. It's king, nine and better, right? Notice ace is slow plays, which is fun. Um, also, you'll notice like pair plus straight draws a pretty good hand. It usually likes to get money in the pot, like 9-8 here. 9-8 is apparently like better, quote unquote, better than 10-9, just because it has additional equity. And then we're betting with bluffs. What are bluffs? Any hand with an 8, any hand with a 6, two over cards, ideally with a backdoor flush draw, are very good bluffs. Also notice some just total air balls are bluffing, which is kind of fun to see. What about if our range is wider? Well, now notice again, same rough range is betting for value. Notice 9-8 and 9-6 get after it. Um, over pairs, top pairs, lots of eights are betting, lots of sixes are betting. And then random over cards, same story, right? Notice you can be a little bit more selective with the uh, backdoor over card draws, like King Jack of Diamonds here, because with King Jack of Diamonds, now you don't really need to bet that. You'd rather bet a lower equity hand like King 10 offsuit. Okay? Fun and good. What about from out of position in this scenario? In this spot, we are, again, betting not that often, about half the time. And again, with a relatively polarized range. It, it's a neat spot here because the opponent's range, depending on their strategy, may or may not actually line up with this board all that well. Some of your opponents who are looser and call every suited connector, they're going to nail this board and you have to check way more often. Some people who don't play those hands because they're nits, well, they're going to have a whole lot of hands in this region, in which case you can just blast them. So... This is a spot where I'm going to be playing pretty far from GTO against a lot of people. What about 7-4-3? Another spot that hits the big blind very well. Notice now we have a lot of over pairs, a lot of backdoor straight draws that can bet, bet or backdoor flush draws that can bet as the under the gun plus one player. We do have some gut shots here. We do have some pairs that are pretty good. So even though this board looks kind of rough for us, it's fine enough. When we are the button versus the big blind, now we have even more hands that are very likely good but vulnerable. Notice lots of top pairs are very likely good but vulnerable. Even fives are very likely good but vulnerable. So we're blasting them. We are using some small bets, but mostly big bets. And again, a very polarized range of best hands. They're good but vulnerable. Some draws with a six or a five. And lots of other stuff is doing a whole lot of checking. You may ask, what do you do if you check? That's going to be another video. Actually, we have an entire tournament and cash game masterclass that goes through all these spots I'm going through right now today with you and more pre-flop on the flop on the turn on the river and all sorts of ways the hand could possibly play out it's a very very long they're very very long courses it took forever to make they're over at pokercoaching.com for you right now what about out of position on seven four three another interesting spot we have to check this one a ton though because all these hands are not in great shape kind of neat you're going to find that in general from out of position, you have to do a decent amount of checking on the low card boards to some extent. Not always, not always. Like this spot you see, 975, we're checking about half the time. Uh, 743, we're checking 78% of the time. So we're doing a decent amount of checking. We also haven't discussed multi-way pots today, which is also discussed in the tournament and cash game master classes at poker coaching. And in multi-way spots, you have to check a ton on the low card boards. Let's take a look at a few common mistakes people make. Whenever you're structuring your range, you can do all sorts of things wrong. For example, in this spot, imagine you bet every overcard with backdoor flush draw, like all the king 10 suited, all the queen 10 suited. What's wrong with that? What's the problem? And alternatively, how can you exploit people who make that mistake? These are things you want to consider. So, Let's take a look at mistakes people can make. Let's take a look at mistake number one. Too much junk slash not enough draws. So let's say we're in a scenario. This is our preflop range. We're going to go through and categorize each of our hands. We have premium made hands, draws, marginal made hands, and junk. 
Okay. What are premium hands on whatever board this is? Notice in this spot, we're probably looking at a nine high board, right? Obviously a nine high board. Maybe it's 975. It probably is 975. So in this scenario, this is a spot where we're betting all these hands in red, checking the hands in green, betting the hands in blue, checking the hands in gray. The problem, though, is that our ratios are out of line. Now, we haven't discussed these ratios, which I do discuss thoroughly in the master classes, but you can have, at most, on the flop, a two draw to one premium made hand ratio on the flop, assuming you're not so deep stacked. So in this spot, we have 17% premium made hands, which means we can probably have, I don't know, 25-ish percent draws. Draws, like queen 10 backdoor draw, stuff like that. Ace eight, ace six, etc. Also, you want your marginal made range to junk range to be something like 70% marginal made hands, 30% junk. These are hands that are checking it back, right? Because then you'll be able to call a turn bet roughly 70% of the time, which will make sure that you are not overfolding to your opponent's aggression. Remember, way back in slide one of this video, however long ago it was, 36 minutes, goodness gracious, we talked about an easy way to crush people is to make them fold too often. Well, if you check back the flop with 70% junk, which is 50 divided by 76, whatever that is, all your opponent has to do is bet the turn and you lose. Now, sure, you're going to get a pair there some portion of the time, but notice it's pretty clear to your opponent which turn cards are bad for you. Like all the low ones are pretty bad for you. All the high ones are pretty good for you, and your opponent can just absolutely crush you. So in this scenario, if you check back too much junk, you are a nit. When, you're, you, when you bet, your opponents know you don't have very many bluffs, and they can just easily fold lots of marginal stuff. And whenever it goes check, check, your opponents can just run you over because you're going to have far too much garbage in your range. So you see, the problem with checking back this flop every time with all these hands in gray is that your turn range, when you get there, is mostly garbage. And that's a big problem. What's another problem you can have? You can have too much, too many marginal hands. Okay, now... We have too many marginal hands, not enough draws. Same scenario, 975. In this spot, we're betting ace, nine, and better. Pocket sevens, pocket fives. A few logical draws, but notice now the plan, at least this player's plan, is to check back all these hands in green and not fold them on most turns. Okay. Well, first things first, they can have more draws, right? We just talked about that same problem as the previous player. Also, though... Now, your opponent, because you're planning to call the turn with all sorts of marginal hands, which is what is implied whenever you say these are marginal made hands, like you're planning to call the turn with king high, your opponent can just value bet you very, very wide. So if your opponents figure this out, they can value bet very wide, and they can absolutely crush you. What's another problem? You can overvalue. Woo-wee. This type of player is betting all top pairs, all middle pairs, bottom pairs, middle pairs, lots of quote-unquote draws, because to be fair, they, they have a lot of premium hands. The problem is in this spot, this player's generally being way too straightforward. Right? Also, if you consider their check back range, what's their check back range? Ace high, king high, and some junky queen highs. Not very good. So when it goes check check, the opponent can just bet the turn and bet the river and make you fold the vast majority of the time. This is what a super duper straightforward player does. And they're usually pretty easy to play against. One more mistake. Slow playing. What if you check everything? Actually, don't check everything. This player's actually <laughs> making, doing, using a really fun strategy. They're checking their best hands, betting their draws, checking their marginal mage, and checking their junk. Well, first things first, they're losing value. Don't slow play. Slow playing's for fish. Also, you need to bet your premium hands to balance out your draws. You're going to find that trapping is almost always lower EV than betting. With your best hands, you just want to get money in the pot, especially when those made hands are kind of vulnerable. So don't slow play because whenever you're betting in the spot, all your opponent has to do to crush you is raise a lot if they figure out you are a habitual slow player. And um, that's not good. Also, your opponent, I mean, look, Anytime you do anything that's obviously wrong, your opponents are going to figure it out if they pl are playing with you for like two hours, assuming it's something you're regularly doing. And if you're playing with the same players on a regular basis, they will absolutely crush you. So you cannot have these egregious mistakes in your range. One more spot. Someone who's drastically over bluffing. This isn't even uh, too bad. 
this player is betting with like all a, a lot of their junk. Um, notice I actually have them over here betting with all of their junk. So notice here they have essentially these two ranges are combined. They have about 40% draws slash junk, which is way more than the two to one ratio of draws to premium aid hands. Because like at most they can have 25 or 30% and they have 40. So in this spot, they have far too much junk. And essentially they're making self-sabotaging decisions by getting after it far too often. And that's a problem. You have to make sure that you're using good, strong, balanced strategies so that your opponents can't just play well and crush you. You have to realize if your opponents are playing anywhere near game theory optimal against your continuation bet and you're making any sort of mistake, even if they don't even know what it is, they're going to crush you. And that is the power of GTO strategies. So anyway, I'll leave you with a continuation betting flow chart for today. I hope you enjoyed today's video. We discussed some spots for continuation betting. There's a whole lot more at pokercoaching.com. We actually discuss a lot in the new book, 100 Essential Tips to Master No Limit Hold'em. Check it out. We'll put a link in the description below. Wouldn't it be amazing if this becomes a bestseller somehow because you all like it? If everyone here who clicks like and clicks subscribe also clicks buy the book, oh my gosh, that would be fun. Wouldn't that be fun? Thank you for being here. I hope you learned a little bit about continuation betting. I realize that there is a lot in this video. It's 41 minutes long. I thought it'd be about 12 minutes long. But, um, you know, look, poker's a tough game. You got to work hard. You got to study. You have to actively work to improve your skills. I've done my absolute best to make it as easy as possible for you at pokercoaching.com by giving you all the things you need to succeed right at your fingertips. So please, please, please check it out and make use of it. Good luck. Have fun. Click the like and subscribe button down there. Click the notification bell. We have a lot more videos like this coming out. Whew. Thanks for watching.